Hi everyone, my name is Tom Lane and I work as an applied scientist at AWS in Vancouver. And today I'd like to run through the Gluon API for MXNet. So MXNet is the deep learning framework that we're going to be using. And Gluon is a specific API for MXNet. For MXNet originally, there was the module API. So the module API worked as other similar frameworks did, such as TensorFlow, and the core building block of your models would be symbols. And when designing the network, you would create what's called a symbolic graph. So it's lots of symbols connected with operations in between. You would wrap the symbol with the module API, and the module API would help you with binding data to different parts of your symbolic graph. The advantage of using symbolic graph was that different optimizations could be performed when you're doing the computation. And the Gluon API gives you a number of distinct benefits to the symbolic approach. So being able to define specifically what operations you want to perform on your arrays in which particular order means you can debug your network much, much easier and set breakpoints in code as you would traditionally expect with debuggers. Uh, you also have a lot more flexibility in the way you define the models. And with Gluon, the great thing is that you don't lose out from all the benefits you get from symbolic graphs and the optimizations you can get because you can hybridize your network, which is essentially conversion um, between the NDRA operations to the symbolic operations. So you get the best of both worlds, essentially. And in today's video, we'll be running through the Gluon crash course, which is a really great introduction to Gluon and should get you up and running in within the hour. So to get started with the crash course, we have a dedicated website. Uh, the website, you can find a link to in the description of the video. And you can also find it at gluon crash coursemxnetio So we do have a number of prerequisites for doing the crash course, one of which is installing MXNet. So the install steps for MXNet can be found on the website. If you go to mxnet.incubator.apache.org, uh, we can find the install tab. And here we get a selection for the various platforms and whether you want GPU-enabled MXNet or not. So one great way to get all these dependencies set up is to actually use AWS SageMaker. So SageMaker is a tool that can be used to build, train, and deploy your machine learning models. And one of the features that it offers is the notebook functionality. So all the dependencies that we mentioned there are going to be set up for you, and you can choose different types of instances. And this list includes a number of GPU-enabled instances. So that's great if you don't have your own GPU locally on your laptop or desktop. So with our prerequisites set up, we can head on down to the download section, and this includes a zip of all the Jupyter notebooks that are used for the course. So once that's downloaded, we can extract it and you'll see a number of IPython notebooks in the folder. So here I've already set up an instance and we can open the notebook server. And then I've already done it, but you can upload all the notebooks with the upload button. So let's get started on NDRAs. So lots of packages in MXNet have aliases and shorthand forms. And for NDRA, a very common um, alias that you'll see is ND. So the very first thing we're going to do is import ND array from MXNet import ND. The first time you import MXNet, depending on your specific setup, it might take a little bit longer as uh, just configuring things in the background. But every time you run it after, it'll be much quicker. So to create our very first ND array, we're going to be using the ND array method. And this takes a tuple of tuples. Uh, so here we have a, we're going to create a matrix with two rows and three columns. So first we specify the top row and then we specify the bottom row. We've also got a number of different methods available to us. So here we're going to create a similar size matrix, but with the values filled in as one. And that's using the ND ones method. Instead of specifying the values that we want in the matrix, this time we specify the shape. And so the shape is ordered that we're going to have the rows and then the columns. So we've got two rows, three columns. Uh, we've got other methods available to us with ND. Uh, we can, instead of filling the matrix with ones, 
we can fill it with random numbers. So there's a number of different distributions that we can sample from. Here, we've just got an example where we're going to be sampling uniform. So your equal chance of getting values between minus one and one. And again, similar to the example above, we're not specifying the values, but we've specified the shape parameter. We want two rows and we want three columns. And one last example of how we can create an NDRA. This is with a fixed value. So we're going to use full. And we specify the shape, and we also specify the value that we want to be filled into the matrix of that shape. And remember, this isn't always going to be a two-dimensional array. We can have multi-dimensional, so it could be 3D, 4D, etc. And you'll see that represented in different ways when you print out the array. So let's let's try adding a third dimension. And now we print. And once we've created our end array, we then have access to a number of properties that can be used in different ways. So in all the examples, in most of the examples above, we specify the shape parameter to create the matrix. And once we have the ND array, we can reference dot shape to find out what its shape is. We also have access to a property called dot size, which will tell you how many values are recorded in the ND array. And that's going to be the product of the values we find in shape. So we've got six elements from a two by three matrix. We've also got different data types that could be used. So the values in our examples above are we using float 32s? Well, we all can also create ND arrays with different data types, such as integers. So now we have our arrays created. What can we do with them? Well, there's a number of different operations that can be performed on arrays. So here we've got an example where we're taking two arrays and multiplying them element-wise. So element-wise means that you will look at every single element of x and times it by the corresponding element of y. So if we look at x on its own, we could take the top left-hand value, which is 2, and times it by top left-hand value of y, which is 0.58. And now we do x times y, we're getting 1.17, which was 2 times the 0.58. And this is done for every element of the two arrays. You'll notice also that the shapes of the two arrays are the same. So here we've got two rows, three columns on X, and we've also got two rows, three columns on Y, which means we can do the element-wise operation. Another example, just taking one array this time, is the exponential. So it's going to be element-wise exponential on y. So we take every single value of y, and we're going to take the exponential of that value. So in addition to element-wise operations, we can do more traditional matrix multiplication. So here we're using a method of nd called dot. So it's going to take the dot product between x and y transpose. So another thing we can do with arrays is to take the index of values and we can slice values as well. So here is an example of where we're taking a single value from the array. So the indexes are zero indexed, so they start with zero, which means one is going to be the second row. So 0 0.70, if we look at the original y, that is going to be the second row and the third column. So another thing we can do is to take a slice of the so instead of taking a single value from the array, we can take a range of values from the array. We use the colon to denote different things when we're slicing. So we've got the Y as the array. Its shape was two rows, three columns. And here we use the colon, the first colon, to denote the fact we want all the rows. And we use a range of indices for the columns to say we want from index one up to, but not including, index three. So that's going to give us the second and third columns. In addition to retrieving a slice of values, we can actually set a slice of values. So we use the same slice syntax, but here we're equaling two. So we're going to set these values to two. Now, if we print out y, we'll see the four values that we saw before. They've all been set to two. And building on this, we can also do this on multiple dimensions. 
instead of just operating on the columns, we can operate on the rows and the columns at the same time. So we've got index one up to index two for the rows, which is gonna be just the second row. And then we've got from index zero to index two for the columns. So that's gonna be from the first column and the second column. And so we've set those to four and you'll see those filled in where you'd expect. The last thing that we've got in this section is the conversion between MXNet ND arrays and NumPy ND arrays. So as we mentioned at the beginning, they're very, very similar. And so the conversion between the two works as you'd expect. So the API for doing this is you can take an MXNet ND array and call as NumPy, check the type, you'll see that it is a NumPy ND array and we've got the data type preserved as well. Now, if we wanna map an ND array from NumPy back into MXNet, we can use the method that we used at the beginning and instead of providing values through tuples or lists, we can give it the NumPy array and the conversion will be done automatically. Again, preserving data types. So that concludes the section on ND array. And in the next video, we'll be looking to use ND array and create our very first neural network.